Okay, so welcome to the last segment. This segment's about TTT curves and the iron carbon system. So we're putting it all together, everything we've done in the course so far, and we're actually going to meet a new phase as well. So in the previous segment, we looked at the iron carbon phase diagram, particularly at steels. Steels are things that enter the austenite phase field at temperature um, that are all uh, gamma at some stage in their processing. And uh, most steels are hyper-eutectoid steels, so they're to the left of this eutectoid point. So uh, if you take a steel somewhere between this pure ferrite 0.02 weight percent carbon and 0.8, if you take a steel here, say, then as it cools, um, at temperature up here, it would be in the all austenite regime, um, something like this, say, three austenite grains. As it cooled down, as it hit this point here, then it would start to transform to ferrite, and you'd probably grow ferrite on, uh, on the um, grain boundaries. So that would be alpha ferrite, and that would be your primary ferrite. And as you grew down, as you came down in temperature to the eutectic temperature, oh sorry, eutectoid temperature of 723 degrees, the amount of ferrite would grow and its carbon content would increase slightly. And then, um, as you came down through that, the remaining austenite, the remaining austenite there, that would at that temperature have the composition of the eutectoid t uh, composition, and that would transform to alpha and Fe3C. And in fact, as we've seen before, then the fractions of alpha and Fe3C in that perlite microstructure that forms would then be fixed. And they'd be fixed by the phase diagram by doing a lever rule between 0.02 and 6.7, um, with the composition of the austenite being 0.8. So that's our perlite of alpha and Fe3C. So that's what happens for slow cooling. Now, if we go to uh, higher cooling rates, then we see something different. So, we see a, a curve that looks a bit like this. So, uh, you have a, a curve of cooling rate uh, against um, time, and temperature against time, and something that cools quite slowly shows this perlite microstructure that we've seen so far. So, it's forming the equilibrium microstructure. And something that forms far, uh, cools fast forms a different microstructure. And that microstructure consists of these very fine spiky laths called martensite. Um, and they give rise to a very strong material. And martensite is a different phase. It's a new phase that we haven't seen before that doesn't appear in the equilibrium phase diagram. So it's worth asking what that phase is and how it comes to be. So if we take our austenite, it forms by a, a crystallographic transformation from the austenite. So I'm going to draw out our austenite unit cells. So we draw an FCC unit cell, because the austenite is FCC. Um, viewed from above, of course, an FCC unit cell consists of atoms on the corners, one on the top and bottom face centre, and then one's at a half on all of the face centers there. So it's there are my atoms on my corners there and then I have my atoms on the face centers. There's the one on the top, there's the one on the bottom, there's the one in the back, left, front and right sides. Um, so that's my austenite. Now if I take two unit cells of austenite side by side, there's one there, um, so there's my next one that's my next unit cell over, and that'll be something like that. And again, I'll have my atoms on my corners. I've already got the left edge. I've got my atoms on the top, bottom, left one's already there, back one, right one, front one. Now, if you look at this, you can identify a new unit cell in here, which is similar to a... Uh, BCC unit cell. So that's the top and bottom of it. That's the sides, and that's the front and the back. And it contains within it this one that was on the face center in between. So if I look at that unit cell here, it looks like this. So it's got atoms on the top and bottom corners, 
and it's got one in the middle at a half. And that then, that has a length here, this length here is this length here, and that's root 2 over 2 times the FCC lattice parameter. But of course its height here is just the same as the FCC lattice parameter. So this is a tetragonal cell, so this is a, in fact, a body-centred tetragonal, so it's body-centred tetragonal, BCT unit cell, with its A equal to B equal to uh, 1 over root 2 of the FCC lattice parameter, and its C is equal to A of FCC. And that's then just a new way of viewing the austenite phase. And this is called, then, the martensite phase. It's actually called alpha martensite. Now, it's related to the BCC phase. So the BCC phase is then the same atoms on the corners, atom on the f in the middle of the body, but it has A is equal to B is equal to C. So this is n a way of forming something that's nearly BCC without it actually being BCC. And what happens when you form molten site is that you shrink this new tetragonal cell a little bit in the C direction, a vertical direction there, and expand it in the other two, and there's also a bit of a shear. So you have a shear and some expansions uh, and of A and B and a contraction of C to the between the these this uh, body centered tra tragonal cell and this uh, perfect BCC cell of the alpha phase. And our Martin site is somewhere in between those two. So Martin site is somewhere in between the FCC cell and the BCC cell. And the Martin site, if you like, is a metastable uh, intermediate position in between the austenite and the ferrite. And that's the new phase we form by fast cooling. It's got some of the way there towards forming our final austenite. In terms of composition, it's got the same composition as the original FCC. So if there was some carbon in this FCC, say there was a, some carbon in the interstitial point there, that would end up in the interstitial point um, in the BCC cell as well. So this can happen without diffusion. So martensite characteristically has uh, a couple of things to say about it. It consists of, it's a shear transformation. It happens by shearing the austenite and it's diffusionless. It happens without any motion of the atoms, even of the carbon atoms. So that's what martensite is all about. And that's what this new phase is that we saw in that micrograph. And so when we quench, when we cool very quickly, we see this martensite phase, this martensite microstructure, and it's very, very hard. It has an enormously large hardness, and that's what's shown in this figure. Now if you um, then take it up to an intermediate temperature, something like three or four hundred degrees, you can then uh, get, it to get to the point where you have some diffusion, you have some ability for the carbon to move around, and you can then form normal alpha, normal BCC alpha, not this tetragonal Martin site, and Fe3C. But now you have these very fine, very small Martin site laths, micrometers in size, and they can act as the nucleation sites to form new alpha and Fe3C. So you get very fine carbides. You don't get these lamellae you get in perlite. And then you get something that has better toughness than the perlite microstructure and better strength. So you have a, a, an optimum set of properties if you go through this what's called tempering process, this heat treatment after quenching. So. Um, what we can see on the next slide is what, is what the hardness and ductility look like for the martensite structure, the perlite structure, and this tempered one that we form it third. So the hardness of um, our perlite structure isn't very hard, it's very great, but it has a lot of ductility. 
uh, that is we can pull it a long way before it finally fails. The martensite structure has a huge hardness, a huge yield strength, but almost no ductility. Um, therefore it's not a very attractive engineering material because it doesn't have much resistance to fatigue, it doesn't have much resistance to plastic deformation. Um, and the tempered martensite, when we've turned our martensite into alpha and Fe3C, uh, but with a very fine length scale, it has most of the strength of martensite um, and recovers most of the ductility of perlite. So it's somewhere in between. And it's one of the great powers, one of the great strengths of the steel system is that you can use these solid-solid transformations to achieve a balance of whatever properties you want. So you can either have a, a strong um, but not very tough material, or you can have a uh, weak, not very strong, but quite ductile material. You can have some trade-off between those. And that's called quenching and tempering. That's how quenching and tempering works, and what the quenching and tempering process is. Now there is another form of martensite that you can have, which is called bainite. And bainite forms um, when you have a situation a bit like this. So we're in our, our big sea of, of austenite and um, we could form a little lath there of martensite without any diffusion. Because it's got so much carbon in it, it's incredibly highly strengthened by the carbon that's in solution. But what happens, bainite is where you form at an intermediate cooling rate and you have enough time for the carbon to diffuse out and form little bits of cementite. So that's my Fe3C. And leaving behind a relatively carbon denuded plate of what is now called alpha bainite. Um, and then we have a, a whole stack of these bainite plates with carbide in between. And that's actually the form of uh, what's called lower bainite. There is another form where you precipitate the carbides inside the bainite plates, which you'll see again in second and then in third year. So this is a situation where you've had diffusion of the carbon, because carbon diffuses quite fast, but not of the other elements that you put in, in the alloy, not of the moly or the chrome or the vanadium or those sorts of things. So there is an even another form. And um, when you see, uh, if you go to someone like uh, Sheffield, they will teach most of metallurgy actually through the vehicle of steels, of the steel system, because almost all the phase transformations you can ever have to play with exist in steels and therefore and give you rise to a number of different microstructures which you use in engineering them. They're a very steels focused department, a very steel focused university, because Sheffield is steel town, it's the cradle of steel. Um, here we will use a number of other systems, but it so shows you the power of the iron carbon phase diagram in the steel system is that you can play all these tunes with different microstructures in different forms. So in the next part of the segment we're looking at uh, applying TTT diagrams to steels. So we saw before that uh, we could form a so-called time temperature transformation diagram. So we'd have temperature on this vertical axis and we'd have time, or probably the log of time, so a log of seconds on this axis. Um, and then we'd have the amount of transformation plotted in the diagram. So we'd have here our eutectoid temperature above which it's all austenite. And if we cool quite slowly and cooled for long enough, we'd form some perlite at some volume fraction. Um, awesome. And if we waited longer, we'd get some volume fraction of 90%, say. And that's what we saw before. And up here, nucleation was hard. We had no delta G. Down here, we've got lots of delta G, lots of thermodynamic driving force, but diffusion was difficult. Um, and so we've got lots of driving force down here, but it, we don't have any mobility of the atoms. So we see this sort of TTT diagram where at some intermediate amount of undercooling, then the transformation goes fastest. Now, um, 
The next thing we can see is what happens in a steel where we plot this on a steel. So for a steel, we have a TTT curve that looks a bit like this. Um, we have a TTT curve that looks like that. We get a alpha plus gamma, that's our formation of primary alpha. Goes a bit like, like this. Um, and that's our 1% perlite, 1% perlite form there, and our 99% would be somewhere like that. So that's what the TTC gram looks like for something where you've already got some, you've also got some alpha primary forming. Um, so this is our transformed alpha plus Fe3C in both a primary ferrite and a perlite uh, consideration. So here you've got untransformed austenite that has been supercooled. And at some te temperature that's low enough, you will get that transformation to martensite without any diffusion. If you have enough supercooling, the martensite phase, although it's thermodynamically not the stable phase, becomes the one that becomes possible to form. You've got enough driving force that you can form a non-equilibrium phase that's lower energy than the austenite is at that temperature. So this is called the martensite start temperature. So that's called the martensite start temperature. Um, and that's the point at which you start to form martensite from, uh, from the austenite that's retained. So uh, we can look at what would happen if we cooled this. So we could cool this down and if we cooled this down like this it would all transform to martensite. There might be a martensite finish temperature here as well, where we'd have some amount of austenite and, and retain martensite. And that might or might not be above room temperature. You can design the steel to have the martensite start temperature be above room temperature and the martensite finish be below, and then you'd have an austenite martensite structure, say, at room temperature. You could, alternatively, you could cool at a cooling rate uh, like this, quite slowly, and then you get some primary alpha, and then you transform all to perlite, and you'd be done at that time. Um, or you could go somewhere in between. You could cool it for some time, form some perlite, and then quench it to martensite. You could do something like that. So those are the sorts of games we could play. Now, we can not only play with the cooling rate, we can also play by alloying with this TTT curve. We can shift it to longer times by alloying. In particular, if we add slow diffusing elements like molybdenum, if we add moly, we can push the nose of this curve to the right, which means it's easier for us to cool and get martensite, which means that the steel is easier to get into that very hard condition, so it's more hardenable, so-called. So that's the sort of thing we can do. Um, so one thing it's worth looking at then is what's the effect of carbon on the Martin site itself. Um, and then we'll come back to the TTT diagrams again. We'll start to build a picture of how uh, of Martin site behaviour. So at very low carbon contents, you don't have very much solution strengthening of the Martin site. Um, and so it's not that hard. And its Martin site start and stop temperatures are then very high. Um, way above room temperature, so martensite start is something like 500 degrees C. Once you go to higher and higher carbon contents, then the martensite gets more and more hard because you've got more and more carbon atoms giving you solution strengthening, which you'll study later in this course. Um, and that lowers the martensite start and stop temperatures because the martensite having more and more carbon in it is very unfavorable. It favors then the austenite. So you lower the martensite start and stop temperatures. And at some point, of course, you reach the eutectoid point at which you would start to have a mixture of martensite and austenite, well, near the eutectoid composition, sort of something like 0.7 carbon, at which point um, the, the martensite stop temperature goes below room temperature, and you start to have a mixture of the two phases.
Um, so we can think now about using a real uh, TTT diagram, and that's what's shown on, on here. Um, here we have a real TTT diagram for a steel, and um, and we can see there that it's got a, uh, a, a, the same curves that we had before, a martensite start and stop, a martensite start that's something like 220 degrees C, and a martensite stop of something like 110 degrees C. And we can go through different cooling paths. Cooling path 1, say, is a straightforward quench to, room to say, 150 degrees. And there we'd be 50% austenite and 50% ferrite if we stop there. Cooling path 2 does the same thing but stops um, at something like 250 degrees C and then holds. But it doesn't hold long enough to form any perlite, so it ends up with the same martensite structure as cooling path 1. Cooling path 3 cools to 350 degrees C and then stops and holds and forms 50% perlite. So then we'd have a 50% perlite structure and then it quenches to form martensite out of the rest. Cooling path 4 cools down to 700, well, 630 degrees C quite fast, and then holds for long enough to transform it all to perlite, at which point it quenches. So that gives you a final all perlite structure. So you can see with different cooling paths we can change the sort of microstructure that we would have. Um, and the other thing is we could play with the quenching rate. So we could cool directly at a given rate, d temperature, d time, um, and depending on how we intersected the nose, we could end up with different microstructures. And that would give us different amounts of perlite versus uh, martensite in these sorts of situations. So uh, what this shows us is um, then what tempering does to a fully martensitic structure. So this is changing the tempering temperature for a given constant hold time and looking at how the hardness, ductility, yield stress vary. So uh, as you increase the tempering temperature, then what you're doing is you're increasing the amount of precipitation of Fe3C that you have. And as you go to very high temperatures, you're getting coarsening great um, increases in size of the Fe3C that you form and the alpha. So in the initial stages where you're just increasing the amount of Fe3C, then the hardness goes down as you get rid of the Martin site that's very hard and replace it with slightly less hard Fe3C and alpha, it's very fine Fe3C. The yield stress also drops, but the ductility comes up very far, quite fast. Um, then once you get into the stage where you're also growing the Fe3C, you're getting rid of the hardening value of the Fe3C that you form, then the hardness drops very quickly and the yield stress starts to drop as well, but the ductility keeps on going. So depending on what balance of properties you want, you can pick the tempering temperature to get the balance that you want, but generally you're trading off strength versus ductility. That's what you're seeing. So the last thing to say then is how do we alloy steels? And there are a number of different elements we can alloy steels with. Uh, we can alloy uh, with molybdenum or moly, um, so that's sorry, manganese or molybdenum, um, and those are substitutional elements. That is, they, they go in, they replace iron in the crystal lattice, and they tend to slow down reaction rates. So they slow down diffusion in the material, so they slow down the transformation, they push the TTT curve to the right. So they mean it's easier to get Martin site, so, they, it, so that means it's easier to get it into that hard condition. So they increase what's called the hardenability of the steel. Um, then we have uh, things like silicon, and silicon's quite a funny one because it, it slows down the coarsening of cementite. So it slows Fe3C coarsening. So when we're in our tempering process, so i.e. tempering, what it does is it slows down the drop in strength when we're going through that tempering process. So it makes it easier to control 
tempering. So you, you, it, it's more, you're more forgiving in your furnace for exactly how long you temper it for. And then we have a whole bunch of other elements, chromium in particular, which you quite often put in for um, corrosion resistance. Molly also does this, titanium, vanadium, and tungsten in particular, and they form carbides, like tungsten carbide is the cubic carbide. Um, and uh, they are, um, uh, give you another carbide, not Fe3C, they're not promoting Fe3C, but they're promoting their own carbides that can go in there to give you more strength. Um, and um, so they also, the carbides then slow down grain coarsening. So, uh, and they don't coarsen very fast. So they have quite high um, temperatures to form them, like five, six hundred degrees. Um, but then give you high temperature strength. So these Fe3C carbides, if you want to use your steel at 500 degrees, um, then they'll be not very useful because they'll keep on coarsening, keep on coarsening, and the strength will disappear. These guys, these things like tungsten carbide, titanium carbide, will persist even for elevated temperature applications. So they tend to be used for things like steam pipes in, uh, uh, in, in power plants and so on. Um, so those are the sorts of elements we use and how we use them. These also push around the phase boundaries in the iron carbon phase diagram. They move around the transformation temperatures in ways um, that we have to account for when we're processing the alloys. But there are a lot of options we have in alloying steels, um, which are uh, the whole joy uh, of steel metallurgy, is all of the different options we can use, and using those to develop a steel with the properties that we want. And let's say you can have strengths all the way up to 2 gigapascals in a steel, and all the way down to 300 megapascals, with differing amounts of corrosion resistance or um, uh, resistance to salt water or resistance to um, uh, things like uh, it, what the magnetic properties are. So the alpha phase is magnetic, the austenite phase isn't. If you, don't, if you want a non-magnetic steel, you'd usually have an austenitic steel, and that takes you into stainless steels. We have chromium and nickel. They tend to have, um, well, uh, they will then be stainless because they're all austenite, and the chromium gives you a passive chromia layer, which means that it doesn't corrode. So you have a lot of options in the steel phase diagram, and that'll be the subject of second and third and so on met year metallurgy, which we'll look at in the rest of the degree course. So what we've looked at in this uh, whole course, really, are phase diagrams and thermodynamics and how we can apply those to understand how we develop microstructures in materials and how we can then uh, use those when we're looking at mechanical properties. That'll be the subject of the rest of the course and how we can control those in processing, which will be, the, again, the subject of Mark Wenman's work. who will also look at things like fatigue and fracture. But this starts you off on understanding how we produce microstructures in materials. We've mostly used metallic materials as our example. And we've ended up with looking at uh, TTT diagrams, looking at thermodynamic driving forces and nucleation, and then looking at that set us up really for the climax, which is looking at the iron carbon phase diagram. So that's it for this course. I hope you had fun.